exciting new directions that are going on in the field of education. Um, as you know, he was born in India, and he got his degrees at UCLA, so we claim him you know, as a wonderful product of the California system. Um, he started out at Google, led Google Books for Education, um, both in India. Well, in India it was just all, all Google. All Google, um, and, yeah. And then uh, in Mountain View it was Google Books for Education. Um, and um, he's had really exciting experiences thinking about all of these um, issues as the world has changed incredibly quickly. Um, uh, and um, but he developed the prototypes that he's using now at Google in your extra time, right? Um, and he's really explored it um, in a lot of different directions, and I'm very excited to hear where it's going now. So thank you very much for coming and sharing your insights with us. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for kind of uh, making to the session. Like. Um, Marsha explained the, uh, my prior background is I had led a large team on Google Maps. So I kind of, uh, you know, when I decided I wanted to quit Google and do something in the social space, and I looked at education, the first question for me was, uh, so why doesn't anybody move the needle on education? We spend trillions of dollars, billions of innovation money, and millions of people. And every year it's the same. You know, you look at any country's uh, data, kind of says more or less the same thing. Fifth grade guys can't read at second grade level, or high schoolers don't graduate fast enough, or things of that nature. Right? So, 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 not being an educator myself, I kind of had the uh, kind of the, uh, situations that I didn't know anything, so I could start afresh and I could look at what are the problem the way I saw it. So. Um, as Marsha explained, uh, introduced, uh, I was, uh, prior to Guru, I was at uh, Google, and before that I had la led large projects at Yahoo, I was the engineering lead there. And I started my career actually as a research scientist at uh, Xerox Park. And um, so at uh, Guru, what we, you know, Guru was initially prototyped at Google, as uh, you know, you may have heard of this 20% project thing at Google, at least was there in those days. And um, we have kind of developed the learning navigator, think of it like Google Maps for learning, but with the, specifically we have applied it to math. But uh, the technology itself is uh, horizontal and I'll tell you about who, what other people have been doing. So uh, in an earlier uh, time, two years ago, we even worked with uh, Zach Cardos and uh, kind of uh, Try to uh, look at the whole BC knowledge tracing and so forth for uh, computing the efficacy of learning activities and so on. We can touch upon that later. So, all of you are familiar with Google Maps. I just wanted to kind of uh, illustrate a couple of things. So, one is just the simplicity of use. You land at San Francisco Airport, you want to come to the Guru office, the simplicity of use. I, the system knows where I am, I set the destination, and then it produces a route. And then there's the assured success, which is as I'm driving, it will make sure that you get to your destination. So it's not about 60% of you will make it there, and those who get there will get a C grade and will demotivate you. It's none of that, right? Is this, you know, when I led the team, uh, one of the big teams on Google Maps, I said it's not about driving directions, it's about eliminating the anxiety of travel, right? So, so that's kind of uh, how. I see learning is we have eliminated the anxiety of learning. Then people are willing to put the work and get to their destination all the time, and then uh, we have a chance at the best, right? So, uh, so we kind of want to, so the crux of the problem is how do you, is the blue arrow in Google Maps. How do you become the blue, blue arrow in Google Maps? How do you know where the learner is? Because if you don't know where the learner is, then everything else is a guess from that point forward. You can do any amount of analytics, any amount of uh, AI and machine learning, but you're always guessing. We certainly know a lot about the destination, and that's what we obsess around. All of education, we have curriculum, standards, assessments, everything about the destination, right? And we seldom know anything at all about the learning, right? And at best, we have something like 3.5 GPA, or A grade, or 78%, or some such thing. That's like saying, I'm somewhere in the United States, take me to San Francisco airport. 
it's kind of difficult to navigate if that's the uh, level of precision at which you locate. So essentially, you're kind of uh, traveling around. You know, if we can locate you, we can provide you a route. Let's assume that. I'll share more. But then, as you're learning each competency, you kind of need to get rerouted till you achieve mastery. So you're not going to get keep moving on because it's whatever March 11th. You have to be on page 45 or page 145, whatever it's going to be. Right? That's not how it works. Right? It works like you know, wherever you are, you are kind of moving on after you have gained mastery on the prior stuff. Right? So so that that's the uh, so let's kind of just deconstruct it from a Google Maps perspective, but you will relate to it, but uh, kind of apply to learning, right? So first, of course, is how do you locate the learner? This is kind of ultimately one of the most challenging things. So the single reason why Google Maps works is because every point on Earth has a latitude and longitude. So if you pull up your phone, it says, okay, this is where you are. If there was a Starbucks or a gas station or an accident or a toll booth or a highway or a road, everything has a lat long. Now, we somehow have to develop the lat long for learning so that we can locate the learner against that lat long. Then you kind of have to curate activities. So the biggest uh, challenge that we saw with uh, all of the quote unquote digital learning is digital learning somehow is reduced to watching some videos, answering some multiple choice and things of that nature. So when we saw, when we worked with schools, what we saw was there's hardly anything like that that, was, that happens for real learning, right? Students do projects, they write essays, they write proofs, they kind of make classroom presentations. So, so there are a whole bunch of these things that need to happen. So we kind of said digital learning for us, we interpreted that as digital data from full spectrum learning. So we are not kind of just watching videos and doing multiple choice, but you have to learn however you need to learn. Like, for example, if you have to go collect five insects from your schoolyard and come and discuss it in the class, that's a, the learning activity, then you're not going to reduce it to watch a video on that stuff. The third thing is about mediating pathways. So mediating pathways is how do you come up with the route and reroute? Now, in Google Maps, if you think about it, it's pure geometry. Since you have x1, y1, you need to go to x2, y2. There's some kind of a geometry you apply. There are a bunch of constraints in the roads and one ways and things of that nature, and then you get to some optimal route. Now, in learning, learning is more than uh, applying geometric principles because there's the science of learning. You know, the same next activity for two students who got this Pythagorean theorem quiz question wrong could challenge one student and demotivate the other. So where is the learning science that underlies how we come up with the route and the route? Unlike Google Maps, there is a teacher in the classroom. Learning is more than Pythagorean theorem and photosynthesis. So how do you kind of leverage the teacher and what is her role in this? So what we have constructed the teacher's role as like an air traffic controller. So she's able to see how the whole, uh, all the students are navigating and she's able to intervene based on that, right? And uh, finally, a piece that we have just started working on is how do you integrate communities? Since what uh, you know, teachers need to support each other, students need to kind of uh, provide peer help and so forth. So, where is the what is the role of the community in supporting your journey from your starting point to your destination? So, this kind of um, you know, we think of to navigate a learner, you have to first locate them, curate, mediate, facilitate, and integrate. So, these are the five things that we do, and uh, that's kind of how we make sure that the student gets to their destination. So, so we kind of uh, think of this as navigated learning, right? So it's, you know, people have other words like adaptive learning, personalized learning, and all kinds of stuff. But because we are differentiated on many of these comps, and we place teacher at the center of the whole thing, of the learning experience. And the role of the teacher is important in that model, number one. Number two, the, um, um, it's a full spectrum of learning activities. You know, how do you support writing proofs and uh, doing classroom presentations, right? How do you kind of emphasize the whole science element in computing the routes and so forth? So, so that's kind of uh, what we think of as navigated learning. And the three kind of uh, critical uh, elements that we put, put in place. One is, uh, like I said, the competency model. 
you can think of it as a competency graph, but um, basically it's a lifelong for learning, right? So do we know very, very uh, granularly and precisely for all subjects what the different concepts that we need to learn and how are they all related? Right, so uh, number one. Number two is, Navigator, if you think about it, is really a data backbone. There is, you know, like Google doesn't build Starbucks or Roads. Uh, similarly, we don't do content or learning science or any one of these things. What we provide is a complete data backbone so that you can make informed decisions about the whole thing. All the stakeholders can make informed decisions. And then we build the decision support apps so that all the stakeholders, students and teachers to start with, but uh, curriculum, curriculum developers and other partners, administrators and so forth, as well, they can kind of make in, informed decisions based on the data that we have. So this is the slide that I've explained, though. We'll kind of set the thing in context, and we should kind of uh, ask any questions if you have after this. Uh, so basically, we kind of uh, look at the different facets of learning. It can think of facets as subjects, think of facets as including non-cognitive skills and so forth, right? So if we are on the math facet of learning, then the x-axis kind of uh, represents all the different domains that you need to learn, and the y-axis is the complexity level. So the thick white line, I don't have a pointer here, I can't reach that far. So, okay, the thick white line is uh, the line that connects the highest competency a student has across all the domains. Again, similar to Google Maps, there are only three states. You have not started your journey, you're on your journey, or you have reached your destination. So there's no failing here, right? So, uh, so we use that dark blue to indicate you have mastery in a certain set of competencies. You have, um, you know, you're in progress, you're working on something, and you have not started some of these gray stuff. So the thick white line that connects the highest competency you have across all the domains, we call that the skyline. So that is the student's location, right? So you have a skyline by facet. So, uh, so that's the student's current location. When you say, what's your location in Google Maps, it's your lat long. And, um, but in this case, it's a point. In this case, it's a polyline. And the destination for the student is the set of competencies grade eight needs to cover. It's a label, you know, call it grade eight, call it algebra one, call it, give it a label, but bottom line, it's a set of competencies that uh, that label is supposed to cover, and you kind of say, that's my destination. So, which again, is in a, is a polyline. It can be a single point, because a point is a line, is a polyline. So, uh, so you can say, my destination is, I have to prepare for quadratic equations quiz tomorrow, so it's, seems more like a point there. But now that everything is a polyline, we kind of can develop the polyline algebra to say, how do you compute routes and reroutes and all of that stuff. So I can now go from my skyline to grade line. There are all kinds of constraints. If you remember this picture, this one on the left top, there are all kinds of dependencies and uh, all kinds of metadata associated with this uh, competency graph. So you use use all of that stuff to kind of uh, get to the uh, destination. So so the, uh, so the this is kind of basically the fundamental thing that once we, we first have to locate the learner and then kind of uh, come up with the route, and as they're journeying, so in this example, there are 19 competencies between the skyline and grade line, and the part about Google Maps is if you're 20 miles from the airport, after five minutes, you're 17 miles from the airport, you know you have made progress. So, so here it shows that you have 19 competencies. After whatever, half an hour, you have 18 competencies. So at least you know you're getting there, and you will get there after you cover 18 more competencies. And we can establish all kinds of other metrics, because the learning itself happens using learning activities. We have data about you know, how other students have learned this stuff. So we can compute mathematical measures like expected time to learn, route, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Any questions? Yeah. So I think you said that facets were subjects. Could be subjects. And Could. how do those differ from domains, like ones you have in the bullet points? So, so 
for the subject of mathematics, these are just the typical domains. Oh, so it could be history or social sciences, a different Could be a subject. Facet. It would be a different facet, you're right. Okay, thank you. But we didn't call it a subject because we wanted to include non-cognitive skills. So you want to build leadership skills or collaboration or communication. Then again, these have domains and domains have different competencies at increasing levels and we establish a skyline and we can take you to your destination. The facets of the domain. It's domains of a facet. It's what? Domains of a facet. A given facet has domain. Like mathematics has the domain of counting and cardinality, number systems, fractions, ratios, and proportion. These are all domains within mathematics. And uh, then there's a terminology from Common Core that we have picked. Not the facet, but the fact that every subject has domains. So a facet like history would have domains like war or things like that. Or could have world history and, mm -hmm. you know, U.S. Uh, Civil War and things like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, it would have some of those, yeah. So you said included within the domains are non so, so non curricular included in the yeah. facets. So I can create a new facet for non-cognitive skills, and that will have different yes. types of non-cognitive skills. But you, but you wouldn't, for example, within the facet of mathematics, include a domain of like problem solving or yeah, modeling? No, that's a great question. In fact, that's something that we are still struggling with, is because some of these, like critical thinking, mm -hmm. is not independent of a subject. The fact that you can critically think in one subject doesn't automatically translate to other subjects. So, so yes, you're right. So that's uh, you hit upon the right point, which is uh, it's not that clean, right? But uh, these are good <coughs> approximation for navigating learners, and uh, we, you know, we are a project that's continuing to work on these things. How do you handle the domains of the are related to? So there is some kind of uh, dependency in, in domains, but because we kind of capture the dependency at a competency level, right? Mm -hmm. So inherently that represents, a competency belongs to a domain. So the competency graph that we have uh, developed and established kind of inherently represents the dependencies between domains. So you're not necessarily studying D1 to D6 in that sequence. We are studying based on what the constraints within the competency graph, uh, right? So. so I guess getting back to that domain specificity question, I was wondering whether like, through some machine learning techniques you can develop some kind of like gradient function that would allow you to look at it more generally, taking that into account. So maybe that's more specific. Yes, exactly. And so, so the point is that we can kind of uh, with large enough data sets, we can actually infer some of these things. See, right now we have kind of uh, bootstrapped the system with a definition of these things. We can come back and validate. For example, if one competency is, uh, is dependent on the other competency is not explicitly captured, but we always consistently see that through data, then we can kind of come back and uh, redefine our model itself or enhance our model based on that. But uh, yeah, we kind of, have come up with this model or use this model as a first step to bootstrap the whole process. So your math uh, facet uh, domain can allow us to this 3D map. So that then mean that um, some, fac uh, some facets in some domains have, may have overlap in some facets, just like you mentioned, the creative thinking may yeah. appear in um, exactly. mathematics or in other some science. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Right. Yeah, I think it's, it's great yeah. to yeah, have so, so map. Yeah. yeah, I'll take one more question and um, see if this point gets made here. Yeah. For when you mentioned assured success, is that success within the school year? Because what if students learn slower or like after the Yeah, so it's not, there's no time base, you know. You can get to airport in 10 minutes and I may take half an hour and that's okay. Right? So we don't make a judgment. We don't say if you start in SF, you are somehow smarter student than if you start in Berkeley, right? You yeah. <laughs> just take longer, that's it, right? Everybody's 10 minutes away from somewhere else. <laughs> so. um, Ashok, uh, yeah. how did you identify the facet in my domain? Like, how did you uh, label it? 
Or yeah, right now it's launch, launch based no, right now it's manually right. crafted. What we have done is we have done it for K12, and we have manually crafted the whole thing. And uh, but uh, but there are clearly uh, machine learning ways of uh, doing this as well. Yeah. Okay. So the question that I was expecting that didn't get asked, which I will ask myself, so I can answer, <laughs> is uh, so learning is not linear. Right? It's not like you're, you know, like the path I showed you. That's a beautiful simplification of everything, right? Learning is spiral. And how do you come back and revisit the same concept, right? Where is the measure of depth of knowledge associated with the concept, right? And uh, so, yeah, the, uh, so for example, every competency we measure, uh, we have a notion of a depth of knowledge associated with it. So you can have a mastery at a particular depth of knowledge and the same thing the suggest or the route planning algorithm will kind of uh, come back and revisit the same competency to kind of deepen their knowledge within that competency with a new activity, right? That's one. The other uh, important thing here is that um, just from a usability perspective, like I said, there's assured success but also simplicity of use. Right, and uh, the simplicity of use is students don't want to necessarily establish their skyline and work all the way up. Like today, if you want to start, you may want to assert that, hey, I know all of this stuff. Don't bother me with all of that. Let me go from here onwards, right? So, so how you achieve mastery is not necessarily by kind of, you know, taking some kind of an assessment and going through that, but it's actually by, um, it could be through assertion, through inference, through what we call as completion, which is you just did whatever your teacher wanted you to do, and as a result, you have completed it. You haven't taken our signature assessment for this to earn your badge, but uh, you know we still call that a mastery. But the system will go back and verify if you really have mastery when you have done any of these other things, and then kind of reroute your code. Sounds good? So uh, basically we kind of uh, think of what we do as use big data to operationalize science of learning, right? So the idea is that, yes, all a navigator really is is a data backbone. So, so we have data. Now the question is how do we kind of use that in decision making that is informed, backed by science, right? So. Uh, so very simply put, uh, a student and his teacher kind of they get have some kind of an interaction with the system, some experience, which results in uh, logging some activity stream data in what you know we use the learning record store for that, and uh, then you use the data from there to kind of uh, compute the vectors for every learner, right? So so the typical learner profile, like. Uh, name or grade and so forth is not adequate. You kind of have to compute what is their performance, proficiency, progress, authority, citizenship, a whole bunch of these values based on the activities that they have done and the data from that. Similarly for uh, the learning activities, starting with things like uh, title, description, thumbnail is good for humans, but it's not really adequate for the system, right? So, so the learning activity kind of, we say, so what is this competency? What is the transcript of this? How summary, phrase cloud, relevance, engagement, efficacy, all of these values get computed uh, from uh, the uh, learning record or activity stream data that we have using a bunch of algorithms so that you are kind of continuously annotating and updating based on how the learning is happening, or how the activity is happening on the system. And then we kind of, uh, Take the, you know, we take all the activities that we have, which are in the millions here, and kind of distill it down to what we call as a learning map, which is kind of uh, the best performing resource, but it's the top 40 or top 50, if not top five or top three. And then use that with the learner vectors and the principles of learning to produce uh, the next step in your journey, right? So what you should do next, and it's we kind of produce the next step in your journey using that. 
Now the principles of learning this is an area that uh, we have a lot of work to do. But uh, what we have done, or the approach we have taken, is to kind of uh, um, encode, you know, in a event condition action kind of a table. We have looked at the, you know, 11 principles of learning that we want to encode, and kind of uh, said, you know, what event, what condition, what action, based on which principle. So we kind of have, we call this an ECAP table, but uh, we kind of have encoded that and. Then we use uh, like a search ranking as the uh, optimization technique, saying, you know, there are different principles of learning that may apply at this time, and then let's kind of do some ranking based on that, and then make the top one or three or five suggestions to the student. Yeah. So is principles kind of like a policy? Yeah. So that. That's not the way we do it, oh. we, we, but it is conceptually that. The way we do it is much simpler. It's you know, almost like a database table, right? And we say, hey, here's the event condition action principle. We encode that, so there are 11 of these, and then we kind of say, hey, which one do we use? Any other questions on this one? Okay, so, um, so basically with the com competency and data backbone, you kind of have to create these decision support apps or navigator applications as we call them. So we'll start with the student and teacher, that's where we have started. We have uh, done you know, partial work on both of these, which is kind of good enough to use with our help, but these guys are uh, clearly not your bulk users. You know, there are a few curriculum designers that we need to work with few administrators that we need to work with and so on. So our emphasis has continuously been on the student teacher app and that's kind of where we are uh, putting a lot of effort and uh, that's what generates most of the data. But these are important if we kind of have to uh, achieve, uh, you know, let people kind of work on this without uh, Guru getting uh, intimately involved. So for example, um, there are people who are using the navigator to build job skills. Uh, for job training, right, in skills training uh, part of it. Now that's not a, you know, they need to go build their curriculum and they have the entire uh, framework in place, right? So people are doing it for health, you know, training healthcare workers and so forth. So while we have been focused on K-12, we have built the platform in a way that other learning can happen. And uh, as a, you know, I forgot to emphasize or mention that uh, we are a non-profit organization with a social mission. So for us, uh, enabling learning across uh, both the vertical as well as the horizontal uh, is important. So that's kind of why we have taken this approach, but focus most of our energy on student and teacher from a UI development. But from a platform development, we have address of that. This might relate as much to your last slide as this one, but I guess I'm trying to uh, sort of situate your system with respect to intelligent tutoring systems in the past, like the Cognitive Tutors out of CMU and John Anderson's work, and a bunch of others that have like the learner model and, and such things. Is it uh, is it that you're using big data, or that the machine learning is somehow different, or like what's the nearest neighbor in the space yeah. to what you're doing? So I would say big data is uh, definitely more current mm -hmm. than when they started their system, but they have, I'm sure, evolved to kind of also adopt that. To me, the first thing is uh, that it's full spectrum learning. Right? We are not altering how learning is done. Right? If you have to sit in the seminar and learn, then that's how you are going to learn. Right? Now, how do we get the digital data out of this activity of yours, this learning activity of yours? So we have developed a rubric-based uh, model. So essentially, the idea is that after every learning activity, there's data, whether it's machine scored or human scored, peer grading, teacher graded, self-scored, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, one important thing. Mm -hmm. Two is the centrality of the role of the teacher in the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? Because learning is a lot more than knowing how to convert mixed fractions to improper fractions, mm -hmm. right? So, so what is the role of the teacher? How do we kind of support the teacher with a full set of tools so that she can A, understand where the learners are, 
and actually do something about it. Not just see pretty graphs and charts, but actually do something about it. Right? So, so that is the uh, second uh, important uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And the third that we have not done, but we intend to do, is the role of communities. And that we have not done enough, we just started working on it, is they, how do we integrate communities? Because, um, you know, at least a lot of the educators uh, whom I talk to, they have told me that you don't give a teacher a lesson plan, but you actually give her enough of a structure and actually have her create the lesson plan with her colleagues. That is the process where she begins to own the lesson plan, and then she is actually facilitating learning correctly. And what we kind of say is, yes, she, in her lesson plan, we call it a class plan, just so that we are not overloading the word lesson plan. So she can start with some predefined lesson plan, the uh, collective, her teacher collective's inputs, and student data, and then actually come up with her class plan as to what she wants to do in a particular class. So that's kind of how we have, uh, we differentiate from uh, all of the rest of the people. So. Are you recommending um, specific whole class interventions that the teacher does based on the patterns that you display in the data? And yeah. what are the, what's an example of what one of those recommendations might look like? So, so for example, a simple reteach a concept, uh -huh. right? If your students are struggling, then I can say, hey, you need to reteach this concept, right? Now, we are not going to, we will even suggest we can use some of these uh, props for that, but it's completely up to the teacher to make that decision. And uh, what I did not uh, emphasize is, whether or not she accepts the suggestion, there's a reinforced learning happening. So the system is also learning, even if you don't, you know, and Google Photos says, is this you? And you say, no, this is my sister. Then either which way, it kind of uh, uh, learns the system benefits. So, so that, learning which ones the teacher says, yes, I want to do this intervention. Yeah, no, exactly. I don't want that. Which ones? And what does she introduce as an alternative when she says no to your suggestion kind of stuff? So mm -hmm. that could be an example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so what I'll do is kind of, uh, yeah, you don't have to pay attention to this, but very simply, quote, I'll kind of show you this stuff. So, uh, but basically, it's learning route based on profile and being route based on performance until everybody gets to their destination, right? It's it's uh, kind of like I said, the simplicity of use is important, and uh, we'll kind of uh, talk about the student experience. We'll talk about the teacher experience as to how she can monitor the air traffic control view of the class and how can she now drill down and get suggestions and support that. And um, there are two more things that uh, about the curriculum designer and uh, administrator that we won't uh, spend too much time. But uh, if you're interested, we can do that. So any questions before I? Can I show you a quick uh, glimpse of how it works? Yeah. Is this being integrated in the classroom or are they doing this outside the classroom? Great question. So it's being integrated in the school district at a district level. But it's independent of the school year? It, no, no, it's part of the school year. So different teachers do it differently. So some teachers say every class period we are going to spend 20 minutes on the navigator. Right? Some teachers say, you know, it's the Wednesday, every Wednesday we are going to do the navigator kind of stuff, right? So bottom line is they can, you know, it depends upon that construct of their class and so forth, how they want to run their whole thing. Ultimately, the entire school system is still designed on a grade level stuff. So she has eighth grade curriculum to count, even though, you know, the student may not know second grade math, she still has the eighth grade math to cover. Right. So, so as a result, you know, we let the teachers uh, do things the way it best suits them. What districts are you So, we have, uh, so there are two answers to that. One is uh, what districts do we work with from a research perspective. So, we work with uh, uh, Lammersville uh, Leadership Public Schools, and it's a charter network. Uh, in based on Oakland. Uh, Lammersville, public, uh, Lammersville Unified School District, it's near Stockton. Galt, which is about half an hour south of Sacramento. And Valverde Unified, PVS2, down in Southern California. And these are the four that we work with on a research basis. 
but our model for um, how we get the distribution is we bring partners and the partners take it to the schools. So in that sense, we are in over 90 districts in the US through our partners who have kind of integrated this into their application. And uh, so that's kind of uh, how we get massive distribution. Like I was uh, mentioning uh, earlier that uh, you know, we also just started implementing in India, in the two other Indian languages and so forth. So we do all of that through partners. We, of course, uh, don't have the expertise to go at this time. Yeah. So, um, so I kind of, uh, this is a, what we have developed is a web app. And the web app is responsive, right? So it looks like a mobile app, but it's not a mobile app. For the simple reason that we can't just keep up with so many different things uh, as we are still developing the whole stuff and uh, developing pretty aggressively, number one. Number two, what I'll show you is a uh, click through so that we don't actually have to spend 45 minutes on a particular competency, but we can get it done much faster this way, yeah. So here the student kind of uh, starts with their navigator and uh, they kind of start on any of the journeys that they have started. So I will start on Navigator for Math. You confirm your grade level the first time you come. And the system needs to locate you in terms of your, uh, you know, what's your current, uh, it's a diagnostic, right? What's your current proficiency level? So you take a test. So you answer a bunch of questions in the test. And um, once you submit, then basically the, you know, your skyline. <coughs> Right, so this kind of indicates the blue eyes of Google Maps. Kind of, uh, what is what is my current location? Right, here are the mastery I have, and you know this kind of where I don't have uh, it's in progress or these things I haven't started as yet. And I can inspect on each of the domains, you know, obviously counting and cardinality, or uh, operations and algebraic thinking, fractions, and so forth. So for each domain, this is a set of uh, competencies I have, whether I have mastery or in progress or not started. So, so this kind of, now this is student can go and say, my destination is grade eight, right? So that is establish their destination or what we call as the high line or the grade line. So, uh, so between skyline and their high line or grade line, we have all these gaps in competencies. So I can inspect what is in grade eight and then ask for directions. So now these directions are very unique to this student because it's from their skyline to the grade line. It's not everybody gets the same course material, no matter what kind of stuff, right? So everybody's destination may be the grade eight, but their skylines are always unique. And as a result, they're from skyline to grade line is where they get this. Now they can kind of look at that and say, yep, sounds reasonable, let me kind of start navigating. So once you start the navigation uh, process, you kind of are studying one competency at a time. Basically, you're studying a bunch of resources, doing a bunch of learning activities, and then you're answering a bunch of questions. And once you achieve mastery in one competency, then you move on to the next competency, right? So now the system, you know, it's like uh, you're used to with maps. All you need to know is to go straight for one mile and make a right turn. You don't need to know which road is one way, which way, and all of those other details. Right? So, so this kind of, from a student's perspective, all I need to know is, yep, this is how I'm going to gain competency on this, uh, uh, on, on this stuff. So I can kind of uh, study a variety of resources, I can do a project, you know, this kind of uh, a project that you need to do, and uh, it's a completely offline task, or read something, and uh, then at the end of the competency, for the things <coughs> that you have, that the machine can score, the machine has scored, but otherwise you can uh, go and score yourself on a rubric. So essentially every learning activity has to produce data. So here I score myself on a rubric and uh, I react to my experience and then the system kind of says, okay, now take an assessment to see how well you learned this stuff. I take the assessment and uh, answer a bunch of questions and then kind of, uh, you know, score 66% on this, not too well. So now I get a readout suggestion. So the readout suggestion basically says that here is uh, a particular competency. It has complete data about all of your 
preferences and everything else, right? What portfolio, what, what effort have you already put in on this competency? What are your preferences for different types of learning activities and so on and so forth? It uses all of that information to suggest a read out. So, uh, before somebody asks, do we have the rights to Kung Fu Panda? No, it's in the mall. We use uh, uh, a kangaroo instead. And kangaroo because we are guru. So, uh, so you can ignore, you can say no thanks, or you can study now. You study another uh, resource here, and now you get to show your mastery. Right? So I kind of say, yep, I want to earn a badge. I answer a few more questions uh, to show my mastery. And uh, then it says, congratulations, you have uh, gained mastery on the competency. And my skyline bumps up. Right? So, so this kind of, you know, it's a lather rinse repeat of step, competency after competency. The system is suggesting a set of activities. You do that, you assess. If you don't do well, you get rerouted. Then, you know, once you do well, you move on to the next competency. Now, the beauty about this approach is uh, the fact that there's a teacher. So it's not like we are stuck with the system all the time to figure out everything for you, right? Beyond a point, basically says, look, go ask your teacher, get your help from the teacher kind of stuff, right? So we are not kind of uh, trying to fully eliminate the you know, intelligent human uh, mix and say, hey, how can the system take over the full responsibility of making sure so the system does enough and you know it works a good percentage of the time, about 80-90%, I would say 80%, but sometimes it just gives up and says go talk to your teacher about it and she can help you and the teacher clearly has uh, other things. So I did not mention this, that whenever you're studying there's this white line, uh, we call that the progress bar, so you can kind of see where you are in your journey. So I can see that I am 82%, that's my performance. Right, because the traditional school system still requires, they don't you know, just want a competency or a proficiency, but they want to know your performance score. Right, so we capture that. Where am I in my journey? So I'm on whatever this blue thing says, I cannot read. And uh, then where am I in terms of my proficiency, where I can see where my skyline is, and so forth. Right, so, so this kind of the uh, experience that the student has, one competency at a time, and they can continuously see their skyline bump up. And you know, there are a lot of opportunities for gamification and all that stuff. And what we have seen is uh, that is ultimately the most exciting thing for the student, since that their friends gained four competencies and they have gained uh, five. So that kind of makes them feel better, and they kind of want to, you know, work with each other so that each of them are making more progress. So it's not like. Um, you know, you study for a full semester until you take the exam, nobody knows what distance you have covered, kind of stuff, right? It's not that situation. So, uh, before I kind of uh, switch to the teacher side, I want to kind of see if there are any questions. Yeah. What prompted the reroute in that example? Yeah, the fact that you scored 66%. So, uh, you know, we have a threshold of 80%, so that prompted. Um, are the students able to set partial goals? So I can imagine it might be kind of discouraging if at the beginning of the year you see how far you have to go. Are they able to set, you know, like by winter break I accomplish this and by spring break I accomplish okay. this? So, so we don't have the goal setting part of it. And then we have done some work but we don't have it in production. But your point is very valid because a lot of the students in ninth grade start at second grade. And imagine if you see a journey that is endless, right? Mm -hmm. So what we have done is we have broken it down into milestones. Mm -hmm. And that's how the, we said saying, hey, get to this milestone first. Don't worry about your destination yet, but this is the milestone that you're really shooting for. So the student kind of goes, you know, focuses around getting to that milestone and that's what the teacher supports as well. So that's a very important uh, consideration because otherwise you can demotivate everybody up front. Um, if the students are in 12th grade and they're at like 9th grade level and there's really, like they're graduating, what happens? Yeah, so uh, we haven't encountered that situation only because we have not worked directly with 12th grades. We, the highest grade we start at is 9th grade, right, and everything below that. So we haven't tackled the situation where your uh, 12th grade student, we introduce this and so on. 
but uh, like I mentioned, Valverde is the one of the school districts we are working with. So that's where we want to test this out, saying, so can we still help a 12th grade student accelerate if they're willing to put in the effort? Because they can still journey however much they want. But we don't have, we don't have that support. Um, along the lines of your question, do you have data that speaks to the question of how students feel while using the navigator? Like what it feels like for a student to, you know, is it, is it fun, frustrating, engaging, challenging, like, or <laughs> do, are, are you just sort of, um, do, you, do you have kind of like theory about that or, or, or data that speaks to that question? So uh, given that there's a question coming from a Berkeley audience, I'm not going to say that our data is a research grade. Right? But we have a lot of qualitative data. We do all of these surveys in every place that we work. And uh, we're beginning to kind of uh, streamline the research uh, level of these things. But uh, the data, so we have a lot of data that, like I said, students like to see their skyline bump up. The fact that small wins are recorded and they can uh, talk about it is very attractive to them. But uh, we don't have research grade data to yeah. say does it improve motivation or does it improve perseverance. And are there aspects of it that students report on those surveys finding, you know, discouraging or frustrating? Yeah. Or, yeah. So students, um, there are a couple of things that students find uh, particularly frustrating. One is when they get stuck, and the system can no longer help them, right? And that is, yeah, because. Some of these kids like to do things at home and stuff like that, and this all works on all the devices that they have. And they feel like, hey, I have to wait for my teacher to come. <coughs> so can, she has to get smarter about it. So that is one thing. Two is the fact that all of the content in our system is third-party content. It's not our content, because we don't do content, right? So, so as a result, sometimes the content that we would have curated, uh, does not work as well, or it's a broken link, and stuff like that. That's a common frustration that uh, students have done, expressed, and what we have done is kind of run our link, uh, broken link detector checks and everything every day and so forth. So we try and kind of uh, eliminate some of that stuff. Um, so there's, uh, seems to me like a exploitation, exploration trade-off that could occur here. Most of your progressions seem probably more hand curated than data driven at this point. But as you go towards more data driven, if everyone's taking the same path, there's not a lot of variance to test. So if you, you go to the GPS situation, let's say there is a main thoroughway that's congested. If you are Google and everyone is following their GPS, no, I'm not thinking for themselves, just following the GPS, you may want to suggest some drivers to explore alternative routes. Yeah. If you don't know what the traffic's like there, you need someone to explore. So that's what we do, right? And I did not emphasize that. Yeah, but basically, we have something called uh, related activities suggestions throughout. So when you are studying something that is on a curated path, we are kind of suggesting uh, activities for you. And we cannot see how many students actually go down that exploration path, number one. Number two, all of the reroutes are through uh, basically the alternate routes, right? Once you get stuck in a given route, then they become the alternate routes that we are curating. So to our curriculum developer it, yeah, UI, we actually suggest you know, that this is a better uh, resource to work with on that competency, because this seems to be uh, producing the right efficacy. Then there's a bootstrapping issue to come up with that related resources, right? So if, if it okay, were okay. behaviorally informed and everyone was taking the same path, you don't have a signal to suggest the related. But if it's content-based and you're saying, okay, what content has similar words and so forth, so are, are you leaning towards the content-based suggestion of related resources? So, so right, right, basically we look at both, like I said, the ECAP, uh, the suggestion is based on ECAP, the principle of learning, the learner vector, as well as the activity vector. Right? So, so we look at all three of these, the learner vectors, activity vectors, and then say how do we suggest to this learner. Right? But today, most of our data is on the activities as opposed to on the learners because people haven't spent enough time doing this stuff. 
So we have a understanding of the proficiency of the learner, but all of the other values like uh, preference or portfolio, we don't have. So we, we're not able to capture uh, the, or leverage the uh, behavior aspect as much as we are able. But at least the way the whole system is uh, architected is it takes all three elements, ECAP, learner vectors, activity vectors, and then solution. This is kind of tangential, not about the content specifically, but about the use of data and um, the awareness level of students who are using this and parents who are using this about the use of data and how the data is being used. And then, so if you look at Europe and what's happening with GDPR, whether students will have a right to kind of remove their data, something like that. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing that we address. So our terms and conditions say the learner owns their data. They have a consent for us to use the data to personalize learning for them. And they have to consent for their teachers to look at their own data, their data as well, right? And at any point, you know, in all, all of our agreements with the school districts, we say at any point you name any student and we'll uh, uh, export the data to you or delete the entire records that we have and so forth. So we have instrumented all of that stuff so that we kind of want to play to a higher bar than GDPR because uh, bottom line is the learner owns their data. And this data is so longitudinal that you don't want to, you don't, you cannot anticipate what else will happen 15 years down the line for this learner. So. So it's maybe a sort of a tactical or meta question, but I guess I'm uh, wondering, since you're using the Navigator and LG so strongly, um, I don't think you used sort of like the mode of transit kind of element. So for instance, when I wanted to get to Van Ness around 4 p.m., I'm not going to drive, right? So I click on public transit, and it has me take a bus to a BART, and then BART, and then I have to transfer to a, a Muni or whatnot, and yeah. I walk. Uh, that seems to me like each of those is like a different activity, uh, right? Um, and I don't know if you thought about possibly using that element of the metaphor. Yeah, yeah. We, we, in fact, we use that element of the metaphor. No. Oh, then the fact that you can handle range of activities mm -hmm. is covered within this model. Mm -hmm. But uh, like, like I mentioned, the different domains of learning. So what if you want to do, you know, uh, teach a professional level, mm -hmm. right? Now, teach a professional, think of it as, yeah, it's all professional learning now, it's no longer K-12, that's like taking the subways, or uh, public transport, or trans uh, transport and so on. So, so, or what if you want to do skills training? Or what, like in India, one of the big projects that, that is leveraging this is they do self-governance, training elected officials at a local village level, and uh, how they need to learn about governance because they were elected officials, and but their education background can be from literacy to PhD and in between. So, uh, okay. So, so yeah. So that's kind of so that's where we use that uh, extension, saying, hey, all this is is a navigator. This is the data backbone. Mm -hmm. Now, what mode of transport do you want to use? What do you want to learn? Where do you want to navigate, whether in California or Kansas City? All of that is completely up to the rest of the ecosystem to come and work with us. So. I guess I have a hypothesis, maybe it's not true, but you thought that uh, like uh, walking might be more remedial than a uh, train or <laughs> more remedial than driving or something, but that wasn't part of no. your calculation. I found my way to this place <laughs> <laughs> from the parking garage by like walking. <laughs> but I mean, a learner could imagine that, like, yeah. oh, now we're going to give you a walking module. Okay. It's like you are not bright <laughs> enough for the <laughs> train. Exactly. <laughs> so we kind of said all of that is covered. All the different ways that we need to learn a competency. So it's all based on this competency. Mm -hmm. Everything, all you different ways you need to learn this competency is covered within the quote unquote driving model. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of uh, uh, implement a variety of other learnings mm -hmm. uh, within this. Yeah. I'm just curious about um, the sequence of learning activities. Um, and how a uh, flexible system is going to be. Uh, and you know, people might skip things or maybe a better order for some students is different from one or another. Um, so in that sense, learning isn't really like driving your car to a destination because um, it's more personalized. And um, I'm just curious as to how that um, will be researched and supported. Yeah, so what we have, that's a great question, and. Uh, since Nancy 
whom you guys had here last week, uh, had this on our board, and uh, she kind of, uh, you know, had, you know, has uh, talked to us about learning progression uh, theory, and that's kind of the approach that we use. Right now, the student has in complete choice at all points. Right, they don't have to go in the path. Mm -hmm. Right, they can jump around, and anything they do that they gain competency gets accrued anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, so you can go learn something, whatever you want, and that competency is accrued in the system, and that is used for subsequent routings for you. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, so so we provide the complete choice to the student, and one of the other things that uh, also uh, hands keeps uh, heavily influencing is it's not about a single route; it's always multiple routes and let the student exercise their choice because that, you know, the ability to choose between routes is an important part of learning. And from my perspective, that also is a data, it's a signal for the data signal saying, hey, what do users like so that the system can kind of uh, learn from that. So in the interface, where is the multiple routes? When you show the app and the navigator, where will the student do that? App interface choose a different route. So, so at, at this point, the multiple routes are not at the main route level, but when we provide read out choices and so forth, we provide more than one selection, right? So, so the main route itself is kind of uh, there's a single route that we provide right now, but we can provide flexibility on that. But uh, right now, where we have implemented the multiple choice of uh, is in the read out. Perfect. So whenever we make a readout suggestion, we may give you multiples of those, number one. Number two, as you are journeying on the route, we are also showing you a variety of other uh, uh, things that you can uh, learn from, right? The suggested resource part. And uh, this kind of, uh, so, uh, it's not very clickable, but basically, yeah. Basically, it appears at the bottom saying you can kind of uh, see the alternate routes, not on the screen, but any of the other screens. But uh, you can see the alternate suggestions that we have uh, provided to you. We move on. So, the teacher kind of uh, starts with this air traffic control view, she has an instant understanding of uh, progress versus performance, where my class is. So she can see that Charles Darwin is kind of struggling, <laughs> Lady Gaga is doing far better, or Topanga Lawrence is acing it, kind of stuff, right? So she has a quick understanding of that. She knows what domains, you know, her class is uh, doing well or poorly on, and so forth. And she can kind of, um, you know, choose to kind of, let's say, the three things. One is kind of engage the class in an activity during the class. So uh, I'll just kind of uh, uh, add items to today. today. And a second. <coughs> okay. So basically the, what the teacher can do is she can uh, plan her activities for the class. She can search on any topic. She can say I want to teach genetics and uh, you know she'll find a good set of resources she can add that to the class right she can similarly search on quadratic equations or whatever and get you know collections and assessments collections are a playlist of uh, learning activities and assessments are a playlist of questions so she can do that and what i did as a shortcut is just used a previous day stuff to illustrate things right so now she can kind of uh, bring this resource up and she's teaching in the class and she's explaining why could mx plus b m changes the slope of the line he translates the line and all that stuff so so this kind of how she uses a variety of resources she has a full set of other things you know some 3d hard or uh, basically anything that's you know you are addressable this can be a resource yeah so uh, so what we have done is kind of uh, crawled and uh, curated over 4 million open resources and then applied a lot of our algorithms on that so that we help a teacher easily curate things into collections and assessments and as a result we have uh, you know over 25,000 collections and assessments that teachers have built and they can search it up or create their own.
Now, uh, similarly, the teacher can kind of, uh, you know, bring a assessment to the class. So, uh, so she can bring an assessment. So she can bring an assessment to the class and she can kind of go live with the class. So instantly as the students are answering, she can see that Charlie Chaplin, Edwin Hubble and John Keats are really struggling over here. So she can click on Charlie Chaplin and see how has he answered uh, the questions and uh, you know ask them to come to the front of the class and do a small group instruction. She can see that uh, Lady Gaga is doing much better than uh, uh, Charles Darwin and she can provide peer support, right? Or she can look at question number five and say, how is my class answered this and do a reteach of this concept, right? So, so the idea is that she has real-time data from what the students have done, are doing in the class, and where do they stand against this competency? And she can kind of uh, uh, very quickly uh, address it in the class at that moment. So this is kind of what we think of as a one class view. So we intend to build a whole lot of other, uh, like, you know, like I mentioned, there's ability for the teacher to add data. There are a whole bunch of other classroom practices we intend to add here. But uh, the point is that once you have all these curated learning resources and activities, and you can have a variety of classroom practices that will promote uh, learning. There. So this is what we call as the one class view. Similarly, the teacher can have a one course view, which is, she can see that every student has their own journeys. You can click on the student, which I will, and uh, show you their individual journeys. But overall for the class, you can see unit one has 20 students studying it at 85%. Unit two has 15 students at 73% and so on. And uh, she can actually before I do this, show you. Basically the structure is a unit has a bunch of lessons and the lessons have collections and assessments, right? So that's the structure that we have. The unit corresponds to a domain, and the lesson corresponds to a competency, right? So, so that's kind of how uh, uh, this is set up. So now I can go and inspect, you know, how my students are doing on unit one. I can carousel through this and see how they are doing on unit two or unit three and so forth. And uh, or I can drill down and say how are they doing on lesson seven or this particular assessment. I can see that Steph Curry and Charles Darwin are struggling. So uh, the system now makes a suggestion for them. And I can reroute the students using my suggestions, right? Mm -hmm. So the system can make, do the reroute, or the teacher can do the reroute, and handle the entire class. So she's not, her workload is not 30 times more, because she now has 30 individual paths. So um, the, uh, uh, similarly, I can kind of look at a particular student. So we'll pick uh, Brenda Lawrence. And I can kind of uh, look at her path and inspect uh, how she has been performing and so forth. And I can kind of drill into any one of the lessons that she's not doing too well or an assessment that she's not doing too well and actually look at how she has performed and the system makes suggestions for me to assign to Topanga Lawrence. So, so basically the idea is that uh, she can manage one student in her course at a time or she can kind of uh, look at the entire class and uh, handle the whole thing very efficiently. So we think of this as the one class period view, this is the one course view, and similarly we have a one student view. So now I'm looking at everybody's skyline across longitudinal, right? Because the student is in my eighth grade class, but for example, Elon Musk is struggling in my eighth grade. So I can kind of look at uh, how Elon Musk is doing, and uh, I can say, sh show me how he's doing compared to grade eight. And you can see that there are a lot of gaps that he has in his uh, learning, right? So uh, the teacher can uh, uh, kind of, you know, in this expanded view, kind of inspect any one of the domains. I can say, show me domain nine, with all the competencies in domain nine, or uh, I want to look at this particular competency. So I can see, you know, what is the metadata, what is the description of this, what is the metadata. The system has some suggestions for me 
I can look at what is Elon Musk's journey on this competency so far, and what is the curated set of resources that we have against this. And again, these are all machine curated, right? So, but machine curated using uh, user signals uh, quite extensively. So, so this is kind of how uh, she can kind of uh, look at any particular student and uh, support them. And uh, she can, so Elon Musk or Lady Gaga in this case, can have gaps in any learning that they have, right? And um, it could be in eighth grade my class or, or the teacher's class, or it could be in an earlier grade, but she has that view and she can, she gets all the system support to uh, make those suggestions. So this kind of, um, you know, very quickly what we have done from uh, uh, teacher's perspective. The next quick couple of things I'll show you is uh, basically there's a, a back-end system. So how we have kind of uh, de developed the lat long so I can look at different categories of learning, different subjects in each category, or uh, I can look at a particular uh, uh, <coughs> course and look at the domains, look at the domain and look at the competencies, or uh, look at the competency and look at the concepts, and ask for what, you know, it's like saying, show me all the coffee shops near me, right? In a particular competency, show me everything that I can use over here. So it says you have one course or 51 resources or 24, questions and so forth, I can ask for more information. So all of this data curation with prerequisites and all the different content that we have, all of this uh, uh, material is, uh, you know, continuously refreshed and available and completely curated and so forth. So, so this is kind of the underlying infrastructure that we use to make the rest of the Navigator work. And uh, I'll mention, but we won't uh, go into it, is this notion of a crosswalk. As you know, Texas has its own standards for teaching. California has its own standards for teaching. So, you know, the equivalent of Starbucks has a lat long, but you may want Starbucks address in Spanish, and I may want it in uh, Hindi, and that's fine. The system will support both. And uh, but as long as the system is concerned, it always uses lat long. So that is one. The other thing that we are uh, now working on is. See, because we have this idea of one competency gained by one student, can we now completely provide data to everybody in the ecosystem up, up the chain, right? So I can say in Texas, how are these districts doing? 157,000. So first of all, in uh, Texas, month of July, month of June, I can look at, or month of July, how is it doing? I can click on any one of these districts and see 38,000 competencies were gained thousand competencies in a particular school or a particular classroom and so forth, right? So, so first of all, we have, for the first time, the ability to understand for every administrator to track how many competencies were gained by my student, right? So, so this kind of, otherwise, like I say, education is a graveyard of successful projects. Everybody's project in the nonprofit space, for sure, is a success, right? And except that the student is continuously not making it. So what we have uh, said is, let's actually build complete transparency into the whole thing. Let's actually see the competencies gained by student. So these competencies and this whole system has nothing to do with these summative scores. You still have to take whatever uh, uh, SBAC tests and whatever tests your school wants you to take to get your real grades. But this kind of assures you that you know the stuff before you actually get there. Right? So I can now kind of go look at you know, um, for the state of Texas, how many new students and new teachers joined today, or I can look at the average time they're spending on different <coughs> activities, or how they are doing it in terms of performance or in terms of proficiency. I can kind of look at it by all grades or particular grade and so on. So the, um, I can kind of, you know, if I'm a content provider, I can look at, you know, how is my content being used? Right in the United States of America or South Africa or India and so forth. So, so the idea is that we can kind of, you know, look how is my uh, coverage in terms of uh, the competency and the different uh, domain side, my content covers and so on. So, so the idea is that we can kind of provide a whole bunch of analytics to everybody up and down the chain so that uh, other decision support apps can be built, right? So uh, this is what we are seeing is that uh, people want to yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the US, uh, all schools roll up to what is a district. 
and the superintendent now wants a map. She wants to know how she can kind of actually intervene. And um, in India, given that it's a country with 1.3 billion people, the schools roll up to what is called a cluster. And clusters roll up to what is called a block. And block rolls up to what is called a district, right? Uh, everybody in up the chain wants that decision support app. And what we are able to provide here is uh, the data for the decision support app. And we have opened up all of our APIs so that other people can come build the apps for these guys using both the data as well as uh, the uh, technical infrastructure that we have in place. So this kind of, um, in uh, you know, quick summary what we have been working on and uh, what we are uh, very interested in uh, doing is to kind of uh, work with uh, you know university uh, researchers and so forth to kind of actually strengthen the science of learning underlying the whole uh, navigator. Right? And we want to focus and we are focused on being engineers for educators. So that's the only thing that we actually do. Everything else, content partners, like the school implementation, or uh, research, or data science, or learning science, or all of that stuff is done through a partnership model that we have. Any more questions? I like the uh, skyline uh, in uh, some ways, but in other ways, I wonder if you might consider uh, norming it to be 100% because because of the jagged structure and all, I think it's difficult cognitively to at a glance sort of get a sense of like what portion of each domain has been mastered. And I think you have like other data that sort of suggests that, but it might be nice to have a toggle where you can look at the competences with, with each, uh, the domains with each competence sort of like having a standard width and then norming to 100% because you know if something goes wrong with a student like they get mononucleosis or there's a little auto accident, you know, you could sort of see a gap percentage-wise. It's just a suggestion you might consider. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. That uh, because we started with that, oh, right? right? And but we didn't pursue it long enough right. because uh, because the way the competencies are developed, if we don't start it at the y equal to zero level mm -hmm. in the stacking up of the competency, because you want to know the top line, the grade line part of it, mm -hmm. then. Um, then, you know, at least the teachers were all confused, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that's kind of when we said, okay, we'll norm it all to y equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So now they are thinking that this domain starts here mm -hmm. at y equal to zero, as opposed to at y equal to five, because we're trying to norm the gray lines, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but, so we switched out of that very quickly, but it's uh, definitely now that we have spent another year working in this model, Mm -hmm. Not a year, about eight months working on this model. We kind of uh, should revisit that, and that's those are all the things that we continuously want to mm -hmm. come back to because uh, this uh, research project at the end. Because so. if domain six has twelve competencies and seven has only two, yeah, uh, you know, it's a little jarring. It'd be nice to see if one out of two is fifty percent and six out of yeah. twelve. Yeah, yeah. Is the code that you created here? available open source to researchers? Yes, and uh, I'll answer that with a little longer sentence. Yes, <laughs> it is uh, available and the MIT license, right? So, it, so in that sense, it's completely open source. But if you go to GitHub, you won't find it, but we can add you to the project. Because just our documentation and governance around it is non-existent almost, right? So we still don't think this open source ready to actually bring other people in. But we have brought, probably there are, uh, you know, a lot of people have come in through such requests. But fundamentally it's open source and we kind of uh, intend, like for example, we are working uh, uh, with a partner in Egypt, right? And uh, they kind of are, uh, they have their own developers who want to build their own uh, decision support apps. And we are saying, yeah, you should go build off of this stuff. And uh, so we have kind of uh, made the code available to anybody who asks for it. So. Do you consider uh, any more information related to student behavior besides uh, their answers to the questions? For example, they may spend 
One student may step, it may stand several seconds to answer a question, but the other may spend uh, more time on it. So the second person may be not very proficient in that kind of knowledge. So we track that information, but we are not necessarily considering that information. We didn't consider that in your model. In our, so we are not computing anything based on that information. We track the data, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, the idea is to build out the learner profile very completely, right? It's trying to understand, like I say, it's the big picture. We want to get the big picture of the learning activities and the small picture of the learner, right? Every learner is unique, so we want to see the small picture there. Yeah. And, you know, so how, how well do we define the model for what a learner profile is, is important. So right now, our learner profile is defined with these values of progress, performance, proficiency, and uh, preference, and portfolio, right? And, but we continuously intend to build on that as we kind of see how uh, both uh, the users want as well as our algorithms want. And uh, we definitely will go on to do that. <laughs> yeah, and maybe also, um, uh, how many a student who is not proficient in some knowledge may uh, they failed a lot of times on um, some exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but with, regard, with respect to the same knowledge. So, yeah. yeah. It includes more complicated information, more personalized. So, one thing that I <coughs> did not mention is one of the things in the competency graph, uh, if we uh, go back to that diagram, which uh, is um, this notion of alternate conceptions, right? So what uh, we have learned is that for every competency, students, you know, I think of it as misconcepts, but uh, educators don't like the word misconcepts, so call it alternate conceptions. But for every competency, like for example, you know that uh, heat radiates from its source in the inverse R squared R way. So the farther away you are from the source, the, uh, you know, you feel less of that heat. But when you ask students, why is it hotter in summer? The typical answer is because Earth is closer to the sun, right? Because, see, their conception comes from this notion that the farther you are away from, uh, or the closer you get to a heat source, it feels hotter, right? So. There's nothing wrong with that conception, except that when applied to Earth and Sun, that's not the dominant effect here, right? So, so, so we kind of, uh, when you get a question wrong, not only how long did you take to answer the question, but we look at, you know, our uh, assessment items are tacked to alternate conceptions. So we are understanding what conception that you have that is getting triggered in you getting this question wrong. So as a result, we can kind of make the appropriate solution. Uh, so I, I, I tend to think of uh, e learning as in the category of open educational resources, but you've added so much more to that area. But it seems like it's still not without its challenges when you are user contributed content. That's what you rely on, right? You stress that teachers can do the content. So, two of the issues that kind of plague open educational resources: one was metadata, right? How do you have the users say label, you know, the resource they're contributing if it takes on me? You have this rich category mm -hmm. categorization here, right? What lesson does it belong to? What skill? And often users don't add that tag. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second uh, challenge that's often encountered. Um, is uh, in, in addition to uh, not having the tag, the interactivity of what they're adding is hard to automatically integrate into the system. So let's say I contribute some assessment. How do I have that assessment you know, report statistics to these wonderful analytics dashboards automatically? Right? If I am completely unconstrained in the assessment that I am contributing to the platform, how do you, you know, put that in in such a, a rich way? How, how have you gotten around that, or yeah. where are the pain points? So, so there are a few things that we have done. One is, you actually don't need open education resources to make the system work, right? And this is kind of what we are uh, testing out now with the Lamarcia. 
is you're saying, hey, start with your existing course. Whatever you currently do in your school, right? You don't have to touch any of this. We are just a data backbone, right? So your learning activities could be the teacher doing direct instruction, could be the teacher asking you to do a project, whatever it is. You don't have to worry about the learning activities in our system as of now. As of now. But let us kind of instrument your curriculum so that it, we are able to collect data after every activity. Right? So I can give you, first of all, I'm aligning everything to a competency and collecting data after every activity through rubrics and stuff like that. So now I have complete information about the efficacy of this and engagement and all of this stuff that this stuff is currently happening. So you're basically saying these open education resources are good to supplement stuff, but as core curriculum, what we have seen is schools don't accept that as a core curriculum yet. That's, that's an overstatement, but it's true for 95% or 99%, right? So some people do use open education resources, but for the most part, their core curriculum is their stuff, right? So, so what we're saying is, hey, let's kind of just instrument the navigator around your activity, because ours, it's so a full spectrum is what we support, right? So that is uh, um, number one. Number two is um, kind of how we compute the, how, how do we kind of uh, look at the data of after every activity, and how, do, how are we able to make sense out of the all the metrics is an area that we are con continuously working on. So it's not something that, uh, you know, we feel like it's the last word has been done on that. And uh, what kind of measures, like for example, uh, even something like uh, transcript summary and phrase cloud, the role that that plays, because the title says atoms and molecules from NASA.gov, right? In the title, I just don't know what is it about. Right? So if I just compute the phrase cloud or do the transcript for that video, then I know it's talking about the orbital motions and specifically focusing on the, you know, the SPDF uh, part of it, right? So, so, so that's kind of where we know now, is this the best resource for a third grader or a fourth grader who's studying atomic molecules? Even though NASA.gov is a highly reputed one, all the students who have studied this have done well and so forth, but it's inappropriate for that uh, grade level, right? So, so, so all of these things is something that we are continuously still figuring it out, but uh, that's why keeping the teacher in the center of the whole stuff allows us to kind of not take on the full burden on the system, but just you know behave like a tool for teaching. Are the assessments, so you're assessing after every activity in some shape or form? In a lesson. In a lesson, okay. In a lesson. But you're, are you, there's a rubric after every activity? Yeah, every uh, non-machine scored activity, there's a rubric. Okay. Yeah, so if it is, for example, if it's a classroom presentation, if it's a project or whatever, any of these non-machine scoreable stuff, there's always a rubric. And the rubric can be scored either by self-scored or teacher scored. And all of those workflows are there. So, uh, and we are adding peer grading as well. So, uh, so that way, we are making sure that there is good data. Now, uh, this may also address some of uh, one of Zach's point. Is we have built an interface so that if, for example, uh, one of the big uh, uh, supporters and users of uh, Guru is the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. Right, and they use this because all of their training happens. You know, it's a physical training. It's something you have to do. It's not about watching videos or answering multiple choice kind of stuff. So now they, they those uh, they send out XAPI data, and we can aggregate all the XAPI data and kind of uh, uh, you know use that in our uh, uh, in, in our uh, uh, curation of resources. Thank you. This is wonderful. I think you'll be happy to take more questions. Um, this yeah, is sort of I'll, I'll be around. Of our typical yeah. time, um, and we really found it fascinating. Um, it's really impressive that you thought so many of these issues through so carefully. So thank you very much. Thank you.